Thank you, thank you very much to the organizer for hosting this great event. And um, thank you also to all the speakers this morning who set up the stage already um, for some of the work that I'm presenting today. So I'm coming from, from a memory perspective. I'm a memory researcher. And the key question that every member, memory researcher is always asked, how can I improve my memory? Or what, what is it actually? Why do I remember these things? Why do I forget other things that might be important? So the critical question is actually, what's the mechanism in the brain that prioritizes the important information that we actually want to remember compared to the information that we can actually forget, information that's less salient? And usually in memory research, we look at, as we heard already before this morning, at basically at the level of information, when we see the information, what, what, what um, information do we sample, and how do we process this information? But what we don't really look at is how a specific state facilitates learning. And today I basically want to talk about how curiosity state, simply being in a curious state, how does that actually benefit, benefit learning and memory processes. So when we usually bring people to the lab to study, to study their, their memory, um, people see specific, specific items. And usually, as I said already, we look at stimulus related activity with the imaging methods and see how this activity predicts later memory performance. If you want to induce specific motivational states, um, the, the main paradigm that's, that's been used so far is via monetary incentives. So for example, um, in this way, a monetary key was a high reward key, two dollars is shown. And there are different ways to, um, different paradigms, different ways to manipulate, manipulate that. But this is probably the most straightforward one, where a reward queue um, based this contingent, like the reward is contingent whether um, this reward will be paid if the subject rem remembers that information later on in the memory test. So we use this um, reward queue to induce a motivational state. And um, the main explanation so far in the literature has been that a dopamine, like this reward queue elicits a dopaminergic response. And we know a lot about that from, from animal studies, and there's more work on that though um, coming out of it. Humans, where it's thought that the dopaminergic response is elicited by the uh, reward queue itself, and then also a, ramp, a slow ramping up of dopaminergic activity towards the information. Um, as you might know, the key areas in, in, that, in that circuit are the MBTA, the PTA specifically, and the, re the release of dopamine into the circuit, the nucleus accumbens, which is an important hub in the brain's um, dopaminergic circuit. And the key question is really now in this talk, how does this circuit interact with the hippocampus, where we know that the hippocampus is important for forming long-lasting memories. And in fact, it has actually been um, suggested by uh, several theories, um, several models, that these areas actually form, form a, loop, um, to the, a loop between the VTA and the hippocampus to facilitate learning. And we want to look at that now from the perspective of, of how a motivational state um, affects this, this circuit. So in one study, a very seminal study by Alison Adcock et al. At, at Duke in 2006, um, they used this approach, they introduced that approach with the reward queue and with the monitor incentive task. And what they show is basically specific, as we heard already this morning, specific to the reward anticipation period. So if you look at, at activity, sort of whether an item is later remembered or not, um, it's specific here to the reward queue. And if you look here at the, at the PTA, there's an inter interaction between reward and memory performance, um, showing that basically only high reward items that are later remembered show increased activity compared to later forgotten items and compared to no reward items. So this interaction is really driven here by the reward queue. If we look at stimulus related activity, when actually the information is presented, there is no modulation of SMBTA activity. And also the same is true for the hippocampus, um, where the hippocampus shows again an interaction between reward and memory, but no interaction between reward and memory is seen here, only um, reward-related, um, only um, memory-related effects that are not specific to reward. And crucially also, uh, during the reward anticipation, there's increased um, functional connectivity between the VTA and the hippocampus, and this increased um, functional connectivity predicts the memory advantage um, driven by reward. 
So we wanted to take this further now and ask the question, um, we know that already like now from reward, how would that be now with curiosity? Would curiosity really um, influence uh, activity in the same in the same brain areas? And I don't need to say a lot, but look at curiosity. I'm used to that, that I spent five minutes on that slide to introduce that slide to tell people why it's actually important to look at curiosity. I don't do that you know. So we wanted to ask the question, what are the neural mechanisms of curiosity states and how do they modulate learning? And we've heard already now a lot about um, how also surprise is involved in that. Um, I'm actually just um, taking a step back again and really focus just on the curiosity state um, and ignore completely what um, surprise might do. So we have um, three questions that I would like to address. The first one, um, which has been shown already this morning, how does curiosity change brain activity? The second question, how does curiosity benefit learning of information that is associated with high curiosity? Um, and these two questions are very very similar to, to compare what we know from reward anticipation studies, where I shall just showed you the findings. And the third question that is most important to us is, does simply being a curious state benefit learning of neutral incidental information? And I will show you um, um, evidence from different studies on the third question. But first of all, I would like to walk you through um, the first experiment, which was an fMRI experiment, where we started with a screening phase in which we showed participants a series of trivia questions um, and got ratings from them about how curious they are about these trivia questions. And then in the learning phase, we presented them specific questions again that participants saw before. And then after, after scanning, it was a surprise memory test. So let's look a little bit closer into the screening phase to really walk you step by step um, through the different phases of the of the experiment. So in the screening phase, each trial started with a trivia question. For example, who was president of the US when Uncle Sam first got appeared? And there are two ratings, a curiosity rating and an answer rating. In the curiosity rating, how likely is it that you know the answer? Um, uh, the answer rating first, actually. Um, if participants indicate that they know the answer, we would take out this question completely take this question um, to the next level of the experiment. So we really just want to focus on the question where people do not know the answer might have this tip of the tongue phenomenon if you look this morning or have no idea what the answer might be. And then how curious are you about the answer to get like a sensitive rating later on to get this rating for different levels of curiosity and so on. And we don't of course don't show them the answer to these questions in this room. Can you stick closer to the microphone? Okay. I was just wondering about that when I walk around. Cool. Better that way when I go. Cool. Sorry about that. So let's go then to the to the next phase of the experiment, the, the learning phase, which is actually not the actual learning phase that we showed. This is the one that I, as you see that I showed you before. So it's very similar to what's done with reward, where a reward queue is shown, but you, participants then anticipate the information and they don't remember the information. So what we did now in this curiosity experiment, instead of showing a reward queue, we show them a trivia question. For example, what Beatles single has the longest on the charts? For some participants, we know already, this might be a, a question that might be associated with very low curiosity, they don't care about the answer. For some participants, this might be associated with very high curiosity. In the screening phase, we're also there to get like different ratings and have like um, equal trial numbers. Um, for low and high curiosity, which, which was very important for, for, the, um, for the FMI component of the, of the experiment. So we show them this trivia question, then the same thing as in the reward anticipation um, experiment, we basically show them the information at the end. I think it's quite nice to really think about these differences, where it's really like a reward, instead of a reward view, we just show a question that might have some intrinsic value to a participant. And then the information itself, which is similar then to the reward in, in, a, in a reward study. So let's look at the first um, findings of that experiment. And I forgot to mention that the surprise memory test is it's on the same day and it's a surprise memory test. People do not know that their memories will be tested later on. So the first question, how does curiosity change brain activity? And we saw already um, the findings already for that in, in uh, in the talk this morning. So what we find now is like really what we would have expected from a reward anticipation study. What we find in this key areas of the dopaminergic circuit, the SMBTA and the nucleus accumbens, we find a linear increase with curiosity rating. The more curious 
participants were, the more activity they show in both regions. But then we used uh, actually a um, um, regions of interest approach where we restricted um, our voxels in, the, um, in these regions of interest to voxels that are sensitive to reward. So we used uh, an online database for that, uh, Neurosynth, um, um, if you do neuroimaging, you might have heard of it, to really get a very specific um, measure in our regions of interest. So we are basically just focusing on areas and on boxes specifically that are related to, to reward. Usually everybody tells me that I'm speaking so loud, so this is the first time that they're always working. Should I start over with my talk? In case I come back, as an, there's enough time, I can speak to you. <laughs> So, yeah, so we basically had a, like a, a quite sensitive measure based on this online meta-analysis on reward anticipation and see exactly the same trend what we was, would have expected. Um, and just to mention briefly again, um, related to the talks this morning, we don't see any of this relationship during the answer period when the actual information is um, presented. And really the answer might be, we really did not get any, any ratings during the answer, so we do not, do not have any surprise, surprise ratings for that. Um, and also if you do a whole brain analysis, um, we can actually map up quite nicely um, other areas that are um, influenced by dopamine and track quite nicely, um, the dopaminergic circuit. So for example, also um, PFC activity. Importantly, in this contrast, we don't find that curiosity per se affects hippocampus activity. But now this gets important now for the, for the next question. How does curiosity benefit learning of information that is associated with high curiosity? Yeah, so just to drive home this point again, now we're interested basically how these two areas interact with the hippocampus and activity in these areas. How they, <coughs> if they at all facilitate learning. And just a precursor, we basically replicate findings from a previous study um, by Kang et al., which was actually the first imaging study on, on curiosity, where they also showed this behavioral pattern that trivia answers that were associated with high curiosity or the more curiosity it was associated with, the better their memory performance was. And as Roma already mentioned this morning, this is kind of like a sanity check. You would expect that, that pe people who are more, if you're curious more about information, there should be better memory for that. So we replicate this finding again, and again, it's a, strong, it's a strong effect. Almost all participants show that, that trivia answers related to high curiosity are better remembered um, than trivia answers associated with low curiosity. The interesting analysis is now, what are the neural mechanisms that drive this effect? So we did a very similar approach again as in the reward study by, by Alison Edcock. We basically look now at the question-related activity, so it's pre-stimulus-related activity, and resort brain activity by whether an answer will be later recalled versus a trivia answer that will be later forgotten. And we do that separately for high curiosity and for low curiosity conditions. And what we find in the nucleus accumbens is again, is an interaction between reward and memory. So you can see that really only the, the trivia answer recalled with associated with high curiosity show more activity in the nucleus accumbens compared to the forgotten ones and compared to other ones in the low curiosity. Also in the hippocampus, we find um, a similar situation so that the hippocampus dissociates already at the, at the time of the question whether the information will be later remembered or not in the high curiosity, but not in the low curiosity. And of course you might wonder now like, oh, there's actually more activity in the hippocampus going on during low curiosity. We think this is something to do that people during the question, when they see a low curiosity question where they might not be very curious to see the answer, they might probably retrieve other information from previous trials. But there's also an interaction between curiosity and memory as we see in the nucleus accumbens. So again, this seems to be very, very similar to what we would expect with, um, with reward, with extrinsic motivation. And again, during, without any surprise ratings, just with the curiosity rating, all we see at the answer is basically main effects of memory, that there's more hippocampal engagement when an item is later remembered versus forgotten, but we don't find any interactions with curiosity. 
So in a deterministic, um, as it was called this morning, um, way of showing um, the trivial answers all the time, if there's a 100% chance to see the answers, it's really that the reward activity might be really going on at the level of the anticipation process. So now to go to the third question, how does a curiosity state benefit learning of neutral incidental information? And one thing that I actually haven't shown you so far, um, we actually had a little tweak in our paradigm. We're in the middle of this anticipation period where we're thinking that dopamine might be ramp ramping up. We showed an incidental phase, and people also had to make an incidental encoding judgment on, on that phase. In the, in the FMI test, people had to rate quickly if they think this person would know about the answer to this question. So now in the surprise memory test, we also tested memory for these incidental phases. And what we find is that also these phases that are not really, not directly related to the trivia question manipulation also show a memory benefit. That phases presented in high curiosity states are remembered better than phases presented in low curiosity states. This memory advantage for these incident phases is quite small, um, but we have been replicating it over and over again. And I'll, and I'll show you um, in the next slides that it's actually really driven by individual differences um, in in, in the brain data, in the dopaminergic, um, um, in the, in the dopaminergic activity. Um, yeah, this is all I say at the moment. So if we do exactly the same approach again with our analysis as we did with the trivia answers, we again looking at question, at the question, at activity elicited by the question and do a pre-stimulus pre um, subsequent memory analysis where we sort brain activity depending on whether on the same trial the face is remembered versus whether the face is later forgotten, um, and also do that separately for high versus low curiosity. Across participants, we don't find any effects. Across participants, again, the only thing we find is that there's hippocampal engagement when people see the face, which means there's more hippocampal activity when the face is later remembered compared to forgotten at the item, at the item level. But now here at the question related, uh, the question level, we see these, um, these effects driven by individual differences in both the SNVTA and in the hippocampus. We basically see the more activity there is during the question, the more likely a participant is to remember from the curiosity manipulation. So basically, the more, the more activity there is in one of these brain regions, the more they show this um, curiosity-related ben memory benefit for these incidental phases. And we also find the same thing if you look at functional coupling, functional connectivity between both regions of interest, the SNVT and the hippocampus, we see the same trend, um, the same effect that um, more functional connectivity between both regions, the more a subject benefits from the, from the curiosity manipulation. So it really seems that the communication between the SNVTA and the hippocampus also drives these memory advantages for the incidental phases. <clears throat> so going away now for a little bit um, from, the, from the FMI effects, I want to show you now some evidence from, from EEG studies. And we're interested there at theta oscillations, um, particularly because theta oscillations are not only important for learning and memory, but it's also been shown in, in, in animal models that theta is affected by dopamine release. And there's been a few studies that show quite nicely that re reward anticipation <coughs> drives dopamine release, um, specifically in the PFC, and there's also more um, Data coherence in the PFC, and there's also just been shown that there's um, increased um, data coherence between the PFC and the hippocampus and the VTA in support of in support of reward. So I actually just sneaked in this slide now because there was so uh, much talk about surprise already, and so I put this back in. Where we actually um, look at surprise as well in an intracranial EEG project, and with surprise here, I actually mean um, contextual surprise. So this is. Um, data from an, from an oddball paradigm where people encode a series of, of, it, um, of stimuli of a specific category and then sometimes a stimulus from a different category is presented. And in this paradigm, we basically look at theta phase coherence between um, PFC, reg PFC electrodes and hippocampal electrodes. And what we find in this experiment is that basically the high salience items, the surprising items, they show increased theta phase coherence between the PFC and the hippocampus. And it's literally absent during um, standard, um, standard items where there's no surprise factor. 
So this might be uh, this might relate quite nicely to uh, to the work that to the studies to the results that we know from from animal models. I should also point out because we heard a little bit about the frontal polar um, PFC this morning that actually this effect was really specific to electrodes on frontal polar sites and didn't didn't really spread out much. So it was quite a specific effect. So. Going back now to reward anticipation and curiosity states, we were interested now whether during a curiosity state we might find any effects of theta oscillations um, and whether these theta oscillations would be predictive of later memory performance. So, in, and of course with EEG we have a much finer um, time scale to work with, um, as with, with F, compared to fMRI. So we can really look now at the activity that's leading up on a millisecond level to when the information is actually presented um, in, both, in both cases. So I will show you first um, evidence of um, a short reward queue period where people learn faces, uh, sorry, where people learn uh, words. And what we find here is indeed increased data oscillations. If you are not used to reading these kind of um, time frequency spectrograms on the x-axis you see the timing. So basically here at time point zero a reward queue is presented and two seconds later we present the word. On the y-axis you see um, the different frequency ranges and I highlighted here the frequency range, a very low frequency range and the theta frequency range. And you see this increased activity um, in oscillatory power in the theta frequency range. We see that across frontal, frontal sites quite spread out. The maximum again is at frontal polar sites. And very interestingly this effect now, again pre-stimulus, predicts the later memory advantage for the words. So it's again it's a pre-stimulus effect um, during the reward anticipation period. So the interesting question is now, um, with the curiosity study where we basically used the same, pretty much the same approach as um, in the fMRI study, um, where we can now look at the time of the question and then the long fixation period and then when the face is presented. If we look at this long fixation period that actually lasts five seconds up, up to the face, we see again increased data oscillations um, just in the minute before the face is represented. So it looks a little bit different, but if you look at the time scale, this is quite um, a shorter time range from zero to two seconds, and this is from zero to five seconds. So if you just compare that, it's about, again, one second, a little bit less than a second, where you see these oscillatory responses um, in the theta range. And we see that, again, it's more right lateralized on, on frontal, frontal polar sites. And again, this effect explains the high curiosity memory benefits for these incidental phases. So again, in both experiments, reward and curiosity, there's a state-related effect that explains the later memory benefit, benefit specific to the high salience information. So I found this really striking, um, that there's just like so, so many nice parallels, um, where it seems like it doesn't really matter that much um, if you do reward or curiosity. It really seems to tap into, into the same system, into the same mechanisms. Um, and just to, to briefly sum up everything, we, um, we tried to get a better understanding now on, on this memory benefit for these incidental phases and ran, ran a couple of um, studies where we just quickly highlight our results. So in the fMRI experiment, also with the EEG experiment, um, we tested um, <coughs> memory right away after a short time period, maybe around like half an hour to an, to an hour. And we showed this memory advantage. If we do the same thing again, but um, we test memory performance a day later, and this has often been used in the literature to really test for effects of consolidation, not immediate learning processes, but really of con consolidation. If it's driven by consolidation, you would, expect, you would still expect an effect um, after 24 hour delay. And we also find this memory advantage again when we test after 24 hours. So I think this is quite important that this memory benefit is not like an immediate learning related effect that fades away again after, after a couple of hours. It really has an effect later on as well. The, another set of questions was basically then the timing when we present 
the face, these incidental face stimuli in the curiosity state. And there we were a little bit interested, is it actually driven by a phasic dopamine release or a ramping up of dopaminergic activity? So we tested one group of subjects. If you remember, in the, in the original experiment, we tested the face was presented right in the middle of the experiment, which is probably the worst time period you can choose because it's far away from the phasic response and the ramping up hasn't really it hadn't really fully ramped up yet. So we presented for one group of participants, we presented the face right away after the question. In the other um, group of participants, we presented the fa a face um, just before the answer. And that also at the, at the memory test, we tried to get a little bit um, a more fine-grained responses, what actually people remember. So we, we look, um, used a modified version of the remember no um, procedure, where if you're not familiar with that, we basically wanted to get that confidence ratings from participants to see how confident they are about their memory performance and to look a little bit more, look into um, the strength of a memory, but also to recollection-specific response, where people really retrieve specific details um, about the information. And what we find is that we can replicate again the curiosity-related memory benefit for these faces during the early presentation, so when it's really shown right after the question, and it's specific to recollection. We don't see anything for familiarity, so it's really that when people um, retrieve specific details about the faces, um, yeah, it's specific to the early presentation. So it might indicate that phasic dopamine release might be involved in triggering these effects. Quite interestingly, if you look at the late presentation, um, you can see actually that overall memory for these faces in high animal curiosity is, is pretty much similar to the, to the effect here in the early presentation. So there might still be some expectancy going on when people really um, anticipate the upcoming information that actually might drive these um, memory um, enhancement of memory performance in general. And that's actually uh, consistent with the, with the behavioral study as well. So it seems that high curiosity recollection advantage triggered, seems to be triggered by the question and not by the, by the answer. Um, to summarize all the, the findings that I showed you about the incidental information effect, so it seems that these effects are supported by state-related activation and functional connectivity between the SNVTA and the hippocampus. It's supported by, by state-related frontal theta oscillations. It seems to exist both in the immediate and in delayed memory tests. It seems to be specific to recollection and doesn't generalize to different types of memory. And it seems to be triggered by the question, not by the answer. And one final piece um, that I haven't talked about, um, um, I'm involved in a collaboration with um, Julia Gali here in London at Kingston University, London, where we also look at this effect in healthy aging, um, where we can also replicate the effects that um, healthy, in the healthy aging population, we find exactly the same memory benefits for information participants are curio curious about, but also for the information, um, for these incidental information. So quickly, uh, to conclude, it seems that curiosity states enhance the drive to seek high-value information and thereby facilitates hippocampus-dependent learning via the dopaminergic circuit. Um, obvious, um, one thing that I'm really excited about is like the th second point, like this translational approach to bridge findings from neuroscience to real-world learning. Because there's such a host of um, um, such a big literature on reward, on novelty. Um, in, in neuroscience, and I think curiosity might be a very, very nice bridge um, to, to translate all these findings um, to, the, to real world learning, but also like to use really this information that we know already about reward and novelty responses um, and really make uh, specific predictions and hypotheses to test um, questions about curiosity and to try to understand better what curiosity actually means. And of course, um, this has important implications for education, aging, clinical conditions associated with memory impairments, specifically in conditions where we know that the functioning of the dopaminergic circuit uh, might be affected. And last but not least, um, let me thank um, the lab at UC Davis where I worked, um, where I actually did all this work. And also, I just started literally two weeks ago at Cardiff University, where I'm just um, setting up my new, my new group. So if you know any interested, curious, motivated PhD students or postdocs, um, please keep me in mind. And there's also quite a bunch of fellowships um, still, um, still open for, um, to work here at the uh, new imaging center in, in Cardiff. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Alison, go. Yeah, we, we haven't actually done that to really compare that. Um, do you but think they'd be the same, or did you, do you think there would be differences? I, I would think you get the same. There are actually some studies that, um, that showed that already. Um, I think Kuhl can talk more about that as well. Um, so there's like three, four papers actually who showed that with different, if you just do incidental encoding and then you have interspersed, um, interspersed reward tasks, that information, incidental information, neutral information that's close to a reward task or to a reward queue also shows these memory benefits driven by driven by reward. So again, that the curiosity effect is actually quite quite consistent with, with what we know <coughs> from, the, from the reward literature. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Almost worth in itself just crossing the ocean. <laughs> um, since Berlin, there has been this idea that um, curiosity has an aversive aspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack Ma et al. had looked at per, uh, perceptual curiosity and found some um, mm -hmm. markers that were related to insulin aversive components. Yeah. You don't seem to find any, or I don't know if you looked at this aversive component. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, um, we haven't looked at it directly at it. Um, I was puzzled as well with the um, effects from the JEPMA studies from perceptual curiosity. That also one key difference between our experiment here and the JEPMA study is like that it was really probabilistic again, as we heard this morning again. So in the JEPMA study, it was really like a 50% chance that the information was revealed. So again, the reward activity was actually then transferred to the information. In our case, it was really about the reward anticipation, where it was more a deterministic setting, where people really knew they will see the information. Um, we looked at it a little bit in terms of um, um, traits related to curiosity. So there's like this work by, by Littman et al. that associates between a cure, like the more positive and aversive curiosity trait, where the first one is more interest-driven curiosity, which he refers to as like more a positive feeling, and the negative feeling more the deprivation-based curiosity. When we look at how, how these traits um, correlate with our, with our measures here, the memory measures, we don't see any, any, any strong relationships with either of them. The only thing that we find across the board for the trivia answers, also for the faces, is that um, a general curiosity trait, as you would like just measure with very broadly with the openness to experience scale, that this predicts overall memory performance, but it doesn't correlate with the memory benefits related to curiosity, which might suggest that really curiosity trait and the curiosity state might benefit memory in different in different ways. I don't know if that answered your D question. Story long. <laughs> Talk more about that. Thanks for a great talk. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether you think of curiosity as being down upstream from that uh, VT activation, or if I gave you a thought experiment that probably I not talk and some of you are doing right now, if I just asked you to close your eyes and to activate your VTA through neurofeedback, am I going to report that now I'm in a curious state and I want to know more? I yeah. to figure, so your prediction would be yes? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a good answer to that. But yeah, we, we, we haven't looked at that. There's one study by Alison Adcock where they actually did the same thing. You probably know about it with neurofeedback where they activated um, VTA, where they could, people, taught people to activate the VTA. Um, I think they're just working on a component if this if basically modulates learning then of incidental yeah, they information. Ask whether, they didn't ask people to raise their curiosity. No, they didn't. But if it's, if it's a si similar mechanism, yeah, yeah, we don't know. Okay. Yeah, so I have a question that, you know, dovetails with this. I, I just wonder about the specificity of mm -hmm. your effects, right? Mm -hmm. So two mm -hmm. things made me worry. First of all, the, the fact that the, the learning transfers to incidental material that you're not curious about. Yeah. And second, the similarity in the theta activation between curiosity and reward mm -hmm. anticipation. So I wonder if the effects that you find are really specific to curiosity or maybe they're um, just enhanced vis vigilance, enhanced attention, mm -hmm. executive control. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, I've thought a lot about the effect of attention, if attention or simply arousal might drive, might drive these effects. Um, 
I would expect really the opposite, if it's like, because the face is kind of like this distractor image in the middle of the anticipation period. If it's really driven by attention, I would actually expect the opposite of an effect. If somebody's very curious to see the answer, they're really waiting for the answer, and then basically the, the face would be, would be distracting. Did people know they would be tested on the face? They don't, no, oh. they don't. Yeah, they don't know, it's, it's completely incidental. Exactly. The other thing is, like, from um, from actually the, the re reward study um, that I showed, when we looked at ERP activity, it's actually quite interesting. Um, you see a very early response that might be like P1 and 1 um, sensitivity, like related to to reward, which might tap into more arousal attention processes. But these are not actually the effects, so that's driven by the reward queue, but that's actually not the effects that predict later memory performance. The later memory performance is actually always predicted then by a very late effect, similar as we saw it with the, with the theta oscillation. So really like just the few milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, basically ramping up to the, to the word. So I think there's something, of course, there's some complicated relationship between maybe curiosity drives more attention and then basically benefits memory. But I don't think it's like just just attention or just arousal. May, may I just ask a question yeah. uh, to continue on, on, on the topic? That's a methodolo methodological question. Um, so I find really those experiments great. But the, I am asking myself a question. So we are all gathered because we, we are interested in curiosity. We're curious about curiosity, but uh, we don't know what it is. Uh, and we don't know what it is as scientists. And we have only a very intuitive folk idea of what it is as a normal human being. Mm -hmm. And basically, here, you are asking a question to the subject, what is your self-report of curiosity? And I shall probably imagine that each subject has its, has its own understanding what the word curiosity is meaning. And so it's, it seems to me that it's not so obvious what they are reporting. Like, because we are asking a verbal question mm -hmm. on something that is very vague, um, it doesn't mean that responses are, no, are not coherent and whatever, but how, how can we deal with that? Did you imagine using other uh, ways to measure curiosity than verbal questions? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really good question where I feel like, yeah, we need to find new, like as a field, we need to find different ways to stimulate, to stimulate curiosity, not just with, with trivia questions. Like but also, no, I mean, my question was really not so much the use of the trivia question. It was using the self-report question. Oh. How, like, I mean, like, what is your self-report of your level of curiosity? Because my guess oh. is that people would have a different understanding of what this question means. As scientists of curiosity, we don't already know what this means. Yes. And so what is the consequence of using such a verbal question for interpreting the results? And so it, I think it relates to this in the sense that yeah. in, the, in, in the end, as we don't know what is curiosity and as people who, under, who answer the question don't know either what is curiosity, yeah. what, is, what exactly are, are, are we studying the, the impact of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really good question. Yeah, I, I don't really have a good, good answer to that. I agree that we would need like a more more object, objective um, way to, to manipulate that, like really like tapping more, that we can tap more into the value system and assigning value to specific questions um, and, and the information, yeah. I think that's something yeah, that we have to figure out as a, as a field, yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, just a couple of sort of naive questions. Mm -hmm. um, if I was a teacher, I'd be interested in students remembering things for longer than 24 hours. <laughs> so, does what you've found make any suggestions of how curiosity could actually encourage longer term learning mm -hmm. than 24 hours? And the second one, I was very interested at the end, you had two final points, which you threw away almost, which I'm particularly interested in, yeah. is one, the translational effects, right. and similarly, you said there's implications for education, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. I know we'll talk about this hopefully a bit more on Saturday, but could you just give us a heads up of what's in your head on those two things? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So in terms of the, the timing, yeah, 24 hours was basically just the first thing it's easier to do in the lab. There are other studies actually who did, lo did longer time delays, up to three weeks, and they also see these uh, memory benefits after longer time periods, so important for translational perspectives. Um, 
Yeah, and then basically the second question, so what's really the translational benefit of it? Um, I think it's like, yeah, when, when I talk to teachers about that, it, it seems to be that everybody knows, oh, questions, it's important to ask questions um, in the classroom, but it then seems like there are so many constraints that like going through the curriculum that not a lot of people, not a lot of teachers actually do that. So I think the first point really is like having some proof that asking question really works, that it really makes a difference, and basically what are the mechanisms, why it facilitates learning, it's really just to prove that um, and get another question, more like elaborating on the, on the translational. Yeah, so, I mean, we haven't tested any patient groups, but it could be really the case, like really looking more at the dopaminergic circuit, like looking at um, um, patient groups where we know the dopaminergic functions are basically are impaired, and to see actually maybe um, their memory performance could be, could be improved actually if the information that, um, that is shown is curious to them. I mean, a lot of diagnostic tests um, in the clinic are basically just remembering words. And then basically the diagnostic test might say like, oh, this patient has really, really bad um, episodic memory. But what about if they go home and then there are the things that their relatives, their family, things that they're interested in. And actually they remember these things quite, quite well because it has some, some intrinsic value to them. So I think there would be some very, uh, very interesting questions to be asked, like how we can facilitate learning in patient, like in, in with, with memory impairments, um, but also to understand more, not so much translation, but also to understand more about the mechanisms that might drive these effects. I hope that can discuss more about that. Okay. So, um, so I have uh, just a, a brief comment about the question of uh, Pierre uh, about the validity of the writing. So I think that if curiosity is uh, framed as a motivation, it should, if valid, oppose other motivations. And uh, one of the way to validate these uh, ratings is to see whether it's also predictive of the willingness to wait, for example, to get an answer, or the willingness to pay to get an answer. And uh, in the field of uh, behavioral research, there are, there are actually this validation of uh, the ratings. For example, the recent study in the lab of uh, Shoami in uh, New York shows such effects. And, uh, and for uh, Matthias, uh, I was wondering whether you've seen any negative correlation with curiosity at the question stage in your data, because it's very intuitive to report the positive correlations, like more activity in response to more curiosity. But have you seen negative correlations uh, in your data? And if, yeah, just it's really, a, I'm really curious to know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure anymore. I have to go back to the day. I don't think there, there was any negative correlation. Yeah. Okay. And but I, I really have to go back. I, I can't say for sure. And uh, I, as I remember for, in your uh, paper, there is a writing for confidence in the pre-screen session. Subject write their confidence, also yes. their curiosity. Yes. Uh, and did you look at any interaction between uh, response to curiosity, response to confidence? Were they orthogonal? Could you still see uh, curiosity response when? when controlling for confidence? Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that. Unfortunately, we didn't do it in the FMI because like, it pretty much came down to not having enough trials for that. Um, so yeah, I didn't look at that. But it seems to be, if we look at the 24-hour data, we had like, specific to confident old responses with the behavioral effect. And that seems to be what we see now with the, with the behavioral effects, where we just see the effect specific to recollection. Okay, because the way you've selected questions based on different confidence, Right. would be a good way to, to look mm -hmm. at those mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, last question by Tia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a half serious question. <laughs> uh, so it's, it follows from... I give you a half serious answer. Uh, <laughs> on your, um, <laughs> your finding on non-specificity of, of the effects, the incidental effects. So mm -hmm. I have to say, I find it puzzling. And then yeah. the next question about education. So then would you expect that we could get teenagers to learn about physics by getting them interested in two trivia questions just before the, mm -hmm. the class. Yeah. So the first question was, the, the first question was again? No, this is a... Oh, this is the real question. Okay. <laughs> Let's try it out. <laughs> there you get my half, half serious answer. <laughs> so I think it's really, yeah, it's really about the, I think the question really, instead of just showing the information, really trying to get a question, finding a question for every specific student that really might motivate them then to go about and to really seek the information. I think it's really like about 
getting everybody in the classroom to seek to seek the information that they're in the in the right state in the right receptive state. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, and so now we have. Uh...